So I'm Armin uh, Kalikian. I'm a uh, orthopedic surgeon from Chicago, and I'm a professor of orthopedic surgery at Northwestern University Medical Center, and I've been in practice about 40 years. I'm going to talk about tibial plafond fractures or pilon fractures or whichever way you want to call it. We used to say a pilon in uh, this country. These are different from simple ankle fractures. They're a totally different animal and the treatment's totally different. Uh, I can't advance this thing. Can I do this? Okay. I do have some conflicts. Uh, some of the slides are out of these books that I've authored or co-authored and I'm a consultant for uh, some orthopedic companies. Getting into uh, plafond fractures, they're unlike regular ankle fractures, which would be the medial or lateral malleolus. These are not rotational injuries, they're more uh, axial load, uh, like a, a, a pillar on a ceiling. This is a French term, pilon, and it's a noun, it's a, a mortal, a mortar and a pestle, and that would be the um, talus, which would be the pilon, and it jams into the roof, which would be the distal tibia. Again, it's more of an axial load than anything else. So on, on your left, you see a simple bimolar ankle fracture, and on the right, you see a comminuted distal tibia fracture. They are both ankle fractures, but they're both totally different, like night and day. This is uh, not an ankle fracture. These things uh, usually at this point in this country, at least because they're high energy, uh, high velocity motor vehicle and falls uh, type of trauma rather than rotational injury from sports uh, are treated uh, temporarily in an external fixer. When you look at outcome studies of different diseases uh, and everything from asthma to pelvic fractures, to spinal cord injury, you can see pilon fractures are fairly devastating on what effect uh, they have on a person's life. It's almost up there with spinal cord injuries. It's more than multiple trauma or diabetes or heart disease or AIDS. Uh, in the old days, this is one of my father's slides. Uh, this is in the 1960s. We would actually put pins in the leg, in the heel, and in the tibia, and uh, put them in a cast and just try to get them stretched out to length and just deal with the consequences of the problem years later when they need reconstructive surgery, say a fusion or something like that. This has changed. The most common uh, classification, which I really personally don't like, is the uh, Swiss classification of Rudy and Algauer. And it talks about uh, <clears throat> type one, two, and three, depending on the amount of uh, comminution. The, when I trained, uh, we, we swore by this, this is the Bible, and these were mostly ski injuries, boot top injuries, things like that. They weren't the devastating injuries as you see in the type three on your right. And it was taught to us based on the Swiss experience that you should operate on these right away. The ones on the right that you see that are fairly common, it would be a big mistake to op operate on right away, unless you wanna end up with an infection or an amputation because the soft tissue problem is the biggest uh, complication with these injuries. So you don't write a, operate on these right away. You do put them in a spanning fixator, you get them out to length and I'll go through that. And you wait two or three weeks till the soft tissue allows you to operate on them if you need to do surgery. This is the AO classification. It's a little more intricate. They have, uh, they base this on location of the extremity. A four would be the tibia, three would be how far away it is would be distal tibia. A one would be near the knee. Then they have extra articular fractures, which is they have A1. They're not, they don't involve the joint. These can be treated with a plate or a nail. Any of these you see, depending on the comminution. Uh, most people would probably plate uh, the two and three. The B fractures are involved in the joint. They can be the anterior pillar, the posterior pillar, posterior malleolus, uh, an intraarticular medial malleolus fractured that you see on B2, or uh, a chaput fracture, which is the anterior lateral corner on a B1. Those are fairly simple. Those you can operate on right away. 
the ones that are the problem are the C fractures. They're simple ones where they're big pieces. Uh, that's a C1. As it gets more complex, the number goes up, C2. And when they're blown apart on the bottom right, you can see this C3. And these injuries probably need a little bit of time to incubate and to get right before you operate on them. Uh, this is an example of a extra articular fracture. So it would be A, it's not in the joint. It was treated temporarily with pins and then exchanged for a bunch of screws. This is about 35 years ago. It could have been plated. Uh, it's a low energy injury and it's more rotational. There's large fragments and minimal involvement of the soft tissue because it's not a crush. So this is pretty straightforward stuff. This is more like you see after a ski accident. Uh, this is an example of a boot top injury from skiing. And you can see it's displaced. This is something you could treat in a fixer. You could treat with a rod. You could treat it uh, with a plate. It's really the dealer's choice on this one. So these are, even in the pilon fractures, there's differences in the degree of uh, involvement, whether the joints involved or not, whether they're big pieces or small pieces. This is a distal tibia, 4-3, C2 fracture, fairly common. You can see there's a articular fragment here that's flipped up in the central area. And this is a CAT scan uh, after reduction. So your goals, these are the goals of the Swiss. So the goals, they had great ideas. Alignment is important. Length is important, articular restoration. You want a foot that can get on the floor flat, plantigrade. You want to minimize the degree of soft tissue compromise and uh, need for open manipulation. And if there's a big defect in the uh, metaphyseal area above the joint bone grafting. The problem again was when I trained, uh, this was the standard of care to operate on these bad injuries right away. And the complication rate in this country, in the United States, was up to 45, 50%. It's not because we're, we're not intelligent. It's not because we're bad surgeons. It's we were applying the principles from the ski slope to motor vehicle accidents, falls, and heavy duty trauma, which is probably what you see in your country as well. I don't know. I don't think there's skiing out there. And we took what they taught, taught us and we tried to apply it to our population and it the complications were devastating, amputation rate infection. So then in, this, in the late 70s, people came out with uh, delayed treatment for these fractures. They wait up to two or three weeks, they have them in external frames, let the soft tissue injury go down and then stage it and do the open surgery if needed two or three weeks later when the, when the foot was ripe, not when it was swollen. And these are the studies from 1999 at the major institutions where the infection rate dropped from 50 to 3%. The complication rates dropped from 55 to 0%. And they, most people waited 24, uh, two to three weeks for the treatment. Uh, so when you do treat them, you wanna repair the fibula, you wanna reconstruct the joint, uh, you wanna bone graft if necessary. That's an example of that case up in the corner of one I did in the, uh, when I first uh, started in 1980, and I plated it right away and did this. And basically, the, we'd say the Swiss treatment is not for my generation. It should be for my parents' generation, uh, the way we did things. And I'll keep showing that picture. You'll see why. Uh, again, you want to you look at the patient, too. It, polytrauma, what else is going on? Smoking is not good for this. Tobacco is not good for this. Uh, this guy smokes two packs of cigarettes and drinks a lot of alcohol. Not the best patient to operate on. And that's something you can control to some degree uh, by counseling the patient about tobacco. Uh, this is the complication rates I was telling you about. 70%, 50%, 54%. Uh, and then uh, you can see in the last one, OVA and Beals, when they operated on their type 3 fractures, they were getting 10% wound complications and 6% osteomyelitis, which is an example below. This is that patient I kept showing you with the plate that got infected. He had a uh, methicillin resistant staph aureus. I had to take the plate out. Uh, two years into practice, he had to have a local flap and he avoided an amputation. But if I would have waited two or three weeks, I, I would have never had this problem. He'd never have that leg like it looks at this point. 
Now, uh, we use this, uh, the old standard, which I was talking about is not the gold standard. And think of the bone as a banana. And then think of the soft tissue as the peel of the banana. And you have to respect the peel. The tissue is the issue when you're talking about these fractures. So now most treatment for the type C fractures are staged. Initially in the emergency room, that day you put them in an external fixator, you get them out to length and you delay the surgery. You wait two, three weeks, come back and do the appropriate surgery. So we're gonna get into that at this point. But I just wanted to give you the history. Here's what we call a traveling traction. This is very simple. In any country, you put a pin in the heel, a pin in the tibia, and you get them out to length. There's no point in getting a CAT scan or a tomogram till after you have it reduced because it's not gonna give you good information. And you wanna span the joint and it will not reduce the joint fragments, but it will get the alignment of the metaphysis and the uh, tibia. Now, uh, in America, there was a disco music in the 60s and it's not very popular anymore. And I don't think immediate open reduction is popular. Disco is dead and so should be uh, open reduction early. We have a uh, different type of plates for, uh, we can use percutaneously. You can use lock plates, not lock plates, depending on the bone quality, external fixations such as circular frames and Elizaroff that I'll show you as options for your definitive management. This is a temporary fixation with a fixator and in um, wires. There's a lot of different things available. We even do arthroscopy sometimes, uh, depending on what you have uh, available to yourself. The most important thing is preoperative planning. You have to look at the soft tissue. You have to look at the fracture. It, is it out to length? Is the alignment good? Is there articular or joint impaction? Is there deformity, varus or valgus? And the varus or valgus deformity will tell you uh, where the comminution is. If it's a varus deformity, you usually have comminution medially, tension laterally, and you're gonna put a, a buttress plate on the medial side, on the compression side. If you have a valgus injury, uh, it's the opposite. You're gonna put your plate anterior laterally on the compression side. So you buttress the compression side, very important principle. Here's an example. This is a varus deform. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a, a a medial compression, and this one needed a uh, anterior and medial plates. Here's here's an example. I'm sorry. This is the varus uh, compression. So there's tension on the lateral side. The fibula is bent, and there's compression on the medial side. So you put a buttress plate on medially to get this out to length uh, on the compression side. Conversely, for the valgus injury. The CAT scan here, you can see what's involved. You can see that uh, uh, you have an anterior lateral fragment on five anteriorly. The fibula is a small area, the small bone. You have an impacted fragment in number three that is flipped up, it's a central fragment. You have the posterior malleolus in number one, and then you have the uh, anterior uh, uh, tuberosity or uh, uh, the, uh, the medial side in number two. So number five is your anterior lateral fragment, number four is your medial fragment, number one is your posterior fragment, and number three is the impacted fragment. This will give you an idea of a window where you make your incisions to fix this. This one you have, probably have to go anterior to fix this, and you want to fix everything to number one, the posterior side. So you have to have a plan before you go in the operating room. You can't, you can't drive a car in the middle of nowhere and not know where you're going. So you have to have a route. There's all these types of things available, different types of plates, different shapes. We don't have them in all countries, but these are the various things available uh, for you. Fixators, plates, so forth and so on. This is a, a percutaneous plate, which was slid up. You don't have to expose it this much and buttressing the medial side. You can do this through small incisions if you're lying well. Here's examples of little devices we have available here where we can uh, put these different plates on. On the bottom right, you see the anterior lateral plate. On the bottom left, you see the medial plate. Uh, and this is the comminuted fracture above in the upper left-hand corner. Now I'm gonna show you some cases. Here's a, a, a six, 13 year old was playing baseball. It's a sport where you run and you slide. Uh, like someone after they play soccer, they score a goal, they slide. And you can see it's an intraarticular fracture. It's a growth plate injury. 
triplane fracture. This is not, it is a pylon, but it's a simple one where you can just use screws. And here we you see the fracture on the CAT scan. You can see the different fragments, the anterior lateral fragment, the, the medial fragment. And with simple reduction methods, sometimes with something like an arthroscope, you can go in there and reduce this and fix it. You don't have to open the whole thing up. It depends what you have available. So I, I took an arthroscope, I cleaned this up, this about 20 years ago, reduced the fracture, looked at it with x-ray as well, and then just put in two screws. And that was it. This is a simple injury, not a lot of morbidity, doesn't require delay in surgery. This woman walked in my office, I mean, walked in my our ER, not walked in, had a car accident and had this C2 type fracture of the distal tibia, pretty comminuted. And I, had a, I knew I had to put her in a frame. So I put her in a frame in the operating room. This is 2004. And all of a sudden everything came out to length. And I said, okay, well, maybe I'll just shoot some screws in here. Maybe I'll never operate on her. And here she is at, at uh, five years. She has a little arthritis. She's healed. Here she is at four, uh, 12 years, still looks good. Little arthritis. Here's a range of motion, 20 degrees. Here she is just a month ago. I saw her for something else. She has valgus knees. She's had total knee replacements. Her ankle still doesn't bother her too much. Bothers me, but it doesn't bother her. And uh, you can see she's lined up on her mechanical axis and uh, has minimal pain. And I got away with not doing a big operation uh, with simple surgery. I got lucky. And here's her walking in my hallway. This is a miracle knee that's been 30 years ago and it hasn't been replaced. Well, it was 30 years ago, not 17, I'm sorry. And there she is walking, little limp, but not bad, and she's happy. Uh, and that's her x-ray just last week. Uh, the x-ray doesn't look good, but the patient looks good. Now, this is a very, I borrowed this from uh, one of my former residents, Jeff Earhart, fairly extensive fracture. This is a different fracture. It's a type C3, it's the worst you can have. He waited two weeks, then he opened it up. You can see the joint surface where the freer is on the right and went ahead and fixed all this. And that's how it looks. The compression side was laterally. So they put an anterior lateral plate and a buttress plate also medially. And it looks, it looks amazing. So these tight high energy, energy, energy injuries, the type threes, it's been broken down more by other people, Oviedo and Beals, but these are the bad actors and the bad patients. Here's some examples of some simpler fractures. Patient fell down the stairs. It looks like a simple fracture, bimolar, but it's not a bimolar. You can see a shadow in the back. It's a trimolar, and it's really a posterior pilon fracture. When I trained, we didn't fix the posterior pillar. Uh, we fix it mostly all the time now in these ankle fractures. This is a variant of the uh, plafond fracture. And there's some very good articles out of Switzerland about this, when you see this double density on the arrow, on your x-ray, something's broken in the back and they can be in one piece or two pieces. Uh, there's a classification system for this. Uh, type ones are pretty simple, a little piece off the back. Some people don't fix those. Type two, it's two separate pieces. The, ant the posterior tib fib ligament is attached to this. There's a transverse and intermillular ligament. And then there's a type three, which is a large fragment. Now the standard training when I trained was if it's less than 25% of the joint service, leave it alone. That's not true because a ligament attaches to it and there's instability of the joint long-term. And you can see that both the type twos and threes can be bad injuries. Uh, and I consider these pylon variants of the posterior pylon. Uh, how do you approach these? Do you go front, do you go back? The best way for me is prone on their stomach, and we reduce the posterior mollulus first, then we reduce the fibula, you're upside down, and if you have to go medial, you can flip them over or do that side. This fracture you can do within the first week or two. You don't have to uh, treat them with a fixer, but you can and wait. So fix the posterior mollulus first, because if you don't, if you fix the lateral mollulus first, you can't see. The CAT scan is very helpful here. It gives you a plan of where to go, and, and this, this Bone is attached to the posterior tib fib ligament, which is probably 42% of the syndesmotic stability. So here we go. We, we put two little screws in the fibula, not a plate. 
uh, to hold it. We put the posterior plate on after we reduced it and we reduce it extra articular. This ligament has been shown to be 42% of the strength of synesmosis and it does not necessarily need synesmotic fixation like with a uh, screw through tib fib. Here's an example of the posterior lateral approach. We go between, we make a decision just off the distal, off the fibula and the interval is between the perineus longus and the flexor hallucis longus tendon, which is seen right here. Okay, and right now I'm on the distal tibia and I put a retractor underneath the flexor muscle, move that with the neurovascular bundle medially. And here's my fixation. I still stressed it afterwards. I did have to use a syndesmotic suture. Some people will use a screw and I did a bridge plate on the fibula. Another case, same thing, posterior malfracture. This is a type one with a medial malleolus comminuted fracture. First, we put the plate on in the back. Then we put the plate on laterally, patient's prone. This looks like a right ankle, but it's upside down because the patient's prone. And then we fix the medial malleolus with this uh, sophisticated sled. And um, patient did very well. It's the left ankle. Now the patient's not upside down. And you can see the range of motion is good and so forth. Another case, 38 year old slip falling with kids. I don't say if him or her anymore and had ankle pain, went to a local hospital. You can see the posterior malleolus. You can see the, the crescent sign here. You can see the spike here and you can see the fibula is broken as well. So we waited, we got this out to length um, and in the ER, they tried to reduce it, finally got it reduced. So we didn't have to do a fixator here. You can see there's an impacted fragment in the joint. So it's kind of like a pilon fracture. You can see the medial size comminuted. You can see the posterior malleolus, medial and lateral and an impaction die punch piece. And there it is with the arrow there on the axial view. This is a type two, because there's two pieces and there's the piece. So I approach this posterior medial because there's more action medially. And that's between the FHL, flexor hallucis, and the Achilles. And here's the portal. These are different diagrams showing you how to approach these. Here's your posterior lateral incision, posterior medial. This one's a little risky, but you have to be careful in your dissection. You have to know your cross-sectional anatomy. Here's the different portals, how we do it. This is an excellent review article in the Journal of Trauma. And I think all the residents should be looking at this. Here's your posterior lateral that I showed you on the first case and between the perineals and the flexor. Here's the posterior medial between the neurovascular bundle and the FHL. And this is showing you the different windows. This is the posterior lateral window, posterior medial window. You get great exposure to the posterior tibia. This is a fun operation, but do this prone. Here's an example of a posterior medial incision for the plating because the fracture was medial. Here's in this case that I just showed you. Here's the FHL, it's a big piece of meat, beef towards the heel and neurovascular bundle is here. And here's a fracture site that I'm cleaning up. There's the approach, posterior medial approach, patient's upside down and let, later I went lateral. Here's my two incisions after I fixed it, medial, lateral, and my fixation. I have a T-plate, I have a neutralization plate here, and I have a hook plate here for the medial malleolus. 18 month follow-up, decent range of motion. Another one, we have ice in Chicago in the winter. You can't see it and people fall, we call it black ice. And this is a posterior pylon. You can see it's two pieces. And first we fix the posterior piece, then the lateral aspect. And, uh, and then I put a buttress plate medially. Uh, there's no syndesmotic fixation, good range of motion, excellent looking x-rays and six month follow-up uh, walks fairly well without shoes. So no one back. Another one, uh, Mark widening of the joint. Uh, this is not bone, this is the plaster in the cast in the emergency room. I thought it was bone at first. 
and you can see the ankles dislocated. Uh, there was a high fibular fracture, Maisonneuf fracture, but a uh, pylon as well. We reduced, tried to reduce it. Here's my CAT scan. You can see it's two pieces in the back. And what I did is I, I was able to reduce it, waited about 10 days, came back and put a T plate in the back, a hook plate here, and then a syndesmotic uh, screws here. Uh, this is a rotational injury, but it's commuted proximally. And if you put sutures, you would lose length. So we have to maintain length with this. You can see the range of motion, so forth. Toboggan injury, a sled. This is a different pattern. This is more anterior pilon. You can see the medial malleus is part of the, in the joint. There's an anterior chaput as well. CAT scan tells me to go anterior. So I use an anterior approach. Uh, some people do an anterior medial approach. I took out a loose body and uh, I used a medial plate, fibular plate, and I put a syndesmotic staple. Some people would use a screw. I use staples at times to hold the syndesmosis. Seven month follow up, good range of motion. Fractures are healed. Another one fell off a ladder. This is an anterior pilon. So this is uh, the compression side. So you put your plate anteriorly. It's common sense. We Here's your CAT scan. You can see a medial malleolus fracture and an anterior malleolus fracture. And there's a die impaction injury. You see the piece of bone here. Uh, we did this extensile approach. I use a vertical incision, more or less. This is the article I told you about before, general trauma. And then hang it up, make the anterior approach, go in there and clean the joint out, put the pieces back and even bone graft the defect up top. These were loose dead pieces of bone and cartilage that we took out and threw away. Temporary fixation with the anterior plate. There's what the joint looks like from below, not very good, but a lined up big plate and then separate uh, medial incision for the medial malleolus and uh, ended up with a good functional outcome. Now, I think this is gonna appeal to you more and this uh, Lizarov was one of the greatest contributions to orthopedics in the last 50 years, coming from a general surgeon in Siberia. And uh, I met him uh, in, the, in the 70s, uh, interesting person, genius. These bad fractures that go into the shaft and worn injuries are probably better treated with the Lizarov. And it's something you should, I'm sure you know how to do and see a lot of. We don't do it as much in this country anymore, but it's a wonderful procedure. You have to know your cross-sectional anatomy. Uh, we use the clamshell techniques, uh, percutaneous techniques, uh, and usually incorporate the foot. This is a case I did about 20 years ago. Commutative fracture, I was gonna open it. The skin wasn't good. I put it in a frame. I did indirect reduction techniques, a lot of K-wires, a lot of clamps, a lot of olive wires. And uh, you, you you put a lot of your pins in in the, in the in line with the tibial crest. You don't want to be in the neurovascular bundles. So you have to know your cross-sectional anatomy. And you can see this is how the patient looked 10 years later. Has mild arthritis, but still hasn't had a fusion or an artificial ankle in 20 years and is doing well. Uh, there's a lot of advantages. There's disadvantages. The patients don't like them. You can have little problems and access the pin sites and so forth. Here's a patient, a hockey injury, uh, ice hockey. She was playing hockey. It's like soccer, but it's on ice. And uh, uh, she came to the emergency room with a, this pilon fracture, one of the worst I've had in the last couple of years. A spine surgeon put this on. You can see the, the x-rays with the, it's fairly well reduced, a big posterior piece and mark comminution laterally. This is a CAT scan in the frame. Gives you an idea what you have to do. So I first, uh, I got the CAT scan. You can see the medial malleolus, the anterior uh, joint, the chaput, anterior lateral, the fibula, the insertia, and the posterior lateral fragment. So this was my constant fragment. So first I went in the back, I used a Chandler like a shoehorn, and I put the piece back in place. There's a wire in it. I plated that. I fixed the fibula. Then I turned the patient over like shish kebab and went in the back, 
There's the flexor muscle, the perineal muscle, and uh, oh, I cleaned the joint out too from the front. And then I put a plate. I, I've never put more screws and plates in a, a patient before in my life. Uh, bulky joints dressing afterwards. Here she is, well lined up. She's about she's about six years out. Has restricted plantar flexion. I really have restricted plantar flexion and dorsiflexion, and walks good with the shoes. And, Come on, Beth. And plays hockey still. And uh, this is a three-year follow-up. She can walk for you again. Yep. You're too fast. Come on back. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to show you one more case that's interesting, if it's okay. This is something really important. When you have severe comminution, this is a, a lady with alcoholic neuropathy that had a pylon fracture treated like this, fell apart, Charcot, fell apart. I saw her after this, and I put a rod in the other leg. She comes in two years ago with a simple ankle fracture to a friend of mine, fibular fracture. He put her in a boot, let her weight bear. She saw me eight days later. I took a stress x-ray, and now she has a pylon fracture. And I got a CAT scan. The fracture got worse. The CAT scan shows now she has a pylon fracture, anterior and posterior. Knowing what happened to her with the other ankle, I didn't want to be in that trap. So I had to do something different. I could use a Lizeroff, but in a neuropathic patient with a bad ankle fracture, the simplest and I think best technique is put a rod in their leg as an internal brace. There's, I can't fix this. I don't know who could fix this and do a good job. This is an article out of Foot and Ankle International from two years ago. In diabetic patients, I think they had 18 people that they put a temporary splint in. Look at the fracture here. I don't care how good you are, you can't fix this. You put the rod in, it's an internal splint. That's what I did here, it took 40 minutes. I put a screw in her fibula, put the rod in the bottom of her leg, lock nail. We use short, long nails on these neuropathic patients and everything's out to length and she went ahead and healed this. Eventually I took out one of the screws uh, so she could compress it, but she didn't need the motion. And if the rod ever bothered her, I'd take it out. That's a seven week follow up. Now, last thing, this boy walked to my office Monday. He was in Mexico. He broke his ankle off a bicycle and they put him in a cast, never reduced it. And now next week I'm gonna do this. I have a ankle that's dislocated in the back. He's 17 years old. The easiest thing would be to do a fusion, but I wanna give him a chance. I'm gonna do an osteotomy of the fibula. I'm gonna do an osteotomy here. I'm gonna go posterior prone. I'm gonna get that talus back into the ankle mortis. Here's the CAT scan. You can see the fracture right here. And I'm gonna to try to reduce it. I'm gonna try this first before I do a fusion. So I got a lot of stuff. I took a lot of time here and talk a lot, but what matters is take your time, be critical of yourself. Stage these things, the bad fractures. Wait about two weeks to do it. Have a plan, where are you gonna go? Where are you gonna drive your car to? How are you gonna get there? Have a plan, that's a CAT scan if you can have a CAT scan. And if it's, the side is compressed on, you have to have the buttress plate. So if it's varus injury, buttress medially. If it's a lateral injury, valgus injury, you have a plate laterally. This one had both. There's a lot of complications. You want to avoid amputation. You want to avoid osteomyelitis. And if you do a good job, you want to try to avoid arthritis. We can always do a fusion. We can always do a total ankle. But these are devastating injuries, and they can really affect somebody's life. There was a person, an uh, anthropologist named Margaret Mead, and she said the first sign of civilization in a culture is when people help each other. The only good thing about COVID is people are learning to help each other in our country and all the other countries, but helping someone through difficult time is where civilization starts. And if we can't help each other, we can't do anything. She found a person with a broken femur that was healed. In the animal kingdom, you break your leg, you're dead, you're finished, you're gonna get eaten up. And hopefully in our society, we've evolved where we can help people that have had these bad injuries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.